Thanks. Testing. Good. I'm, uh, I'm attached to my podium, and my normal routine is to be running around the stage. Uh, so I'm going to try very hard to stand in one place, and I hope you can at least hear if you can't see. Thanks so much for being here. What a big crowd. Um, it's the 4th of July, and every 4th of July, the New York Times reprints the Declaration of Independence. And one of my guilty pleasures is I get up early in the morning on the 4th of July, and I get a big cup of coffee, and I read the Declaration of Independence. I've never admitted this in public before, but I feel like I ought to be confessional. The, um, the phrases, of course, that stick with me and the ideas that stick with me are the ones introduced early on in the very first sentences where we read that it's self-evident that people have some inalienable rights and they are life, liberty, and then, ding, my eyes light up, the pursuit of happiness. And it occurs to me when I read this that the founding fathers thought that the pursuit of happiness was very difficult but not particularly complicated. There was nothing very mysterious about it. There was no secret of happiness. I mean, after all, for most of human history, uh, life was nasty, short, and brutish. People got up in the morning and they basically tried not to die. Uh, you know, food was scarce, a day of labor was long, your children probably wouldn't live into adulthood. Everybody knew exactly what happiness was. Happiness is what happens when you get exactly what you're aiming for, and that never happens in this lifetime. Well, this theory, turns out, gets put to a test because in the blink of an eye in historical time, we undergo three revolutions, the uh, agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, the technological revolution, and all of a sudden, for the very first time in the history of our planet, large populations of people on Earth have everything they want or at least everything they could possibly need. And guess what? They're not happy. There goes the theory. It can't be the case that happiness is just the result of getting what you are aiming for because when people get what they're aiming for, they don't seem to be particularly happy. The conclusion is very clear. It must be that we're aiming for the wrong things. Now, how can that possibly be? Well, the answer to this question requires that you understand something very unique about human beings, one of the things that makes us an animal different from all the others with which we share the planet. Every animal learns from experience. That starts with one-celled animals all the way up. They all learn from experience, and that's good, but it's a problem because experience can be expensive, right? You have a close encounter of the feline kind, and you learn not to do it again if you survive. Trial and error is a good way to learn, but it has a cost, and the cost is error. Right. Now... Human beings have learned to do something different, something no other animal does, at least to the extent we do it. About two million years ago, nature decided trial and error wasn't good enough for us, and so it undertook a complete architectural overhaul of the human skull. It pushed your head forward, not to keep your hat on, but because your brain tripled in size in two million years. Most of this growth is centered on a particular part of the brain called the frontal lobe, so question, what does a frontal lobe do that made nature think it was so important that you have a big fat one that it actually rearranged the way your skull? Well, the frontal lobe does a lot of things, but one of the most important things it does is it lets you imagine. That's why you are able to know, without actually whipping up a batch, that raw steak banana split is not a good thing, right? The guys at Ben and Jerry's didn't make this, try it and go, error, you can close your eyes and simulate the experience. Now, it's kind of cute when you're talking about ice cream, but think about this adaptation. This means that you are the only animal on the planet that learns from mistakes you never made. Should I stick my finger in the pencil sharpener? Ooh, bad idea. That is a miracle that you can actually know that without trying it. Just like pilots use flight simulators to see what it will be like to be in a plane, this part of your brain is a life simulator and it allows you to simulate decisions before you actually take them. That's the good news. The bad news is it's new and it's still in beta testing. We have the ability to imagine, but imagination has limits. The life simulator fails, and it fails in very predictable ways. Study after study in the last two decades has shown that people make a systematic series of errors when they try to predict not what will happen in the future, but how they will feel about it. Here's an example. 
Now, uh, some of you are professors, almost all of you know professors, and so you know that the career course of a professor is that you work for a little while as an assistant professor, and then after X number of years, they give you one of two hats. Either you don't get tenure and you go spend your life going cheese, no cheese, or you get tenure and you wear the uh, pompous, you have to listen to me every time I talk hat. Okay. Now, here's the question. Which group of people ends up happier? Well, if you ask assistant professors these questions, would you be happier in your life if you get tenure or if you don't, they give you the obvious answers. Now, I'm a scientist, so I'm not going to just yap to you about ideas. I'm going to try to marinate you in data, but I'll try to show it kindly. Here's a study in which assistant professors are asked to predict their happiness in the first five years after the tenure decision, and they think this is a one-item IQ question, right? This, of course I'm going to be much happier if I get it than if I don't. What's the reality? Well, here's how happy people are after the tenure decision in the first five years, and this is a statistically non-significant difference. In other words, it doesn't matter their happiness will be exactly the same. I should mention, by the way, that however the tenure decision goes, everybody is happier than assistant professors. But the point is, they're not happier. They're not happier if they get tenure than... Now, if you find this unbelievable, I don't mean the day it happens. I'm talking about how their lives play out over the next couple of years. This is a failure of the life simulator, and this pattern of data is seen in study after study after study, whether it's about trivial things like how will you feel if somebody gives you a compliment to really important things like how will you feel if you get a, tri a kidney transplant. The pattern of data is very clear, and the only question is why? Why are we so bad at looking into our own emotional futures and figuring out what will make us happy, how happy we'll be, and how long our happiness will last? Well, I think there are four answers to this question. There are four things that we fundamentally don't understand about human happiness, four things that make all of us strangers to ourselves. And what I'd like to do in my time today is tell you what they are. My talk was titled The Four Answers because I grew up in a religious tradition where we have four questions. And I always thought it would be nice to have four answers. <laughs> today I'm going to give you some. Okay, so point number one. I want you to use your imagination right now to imagine buying a newspaper. No, I really mean it. Just take one second. There's a newsstand to help you out. Just imagine buying a newspaper. Okay, you all look like you're done. Yeah, okay. So what bill did you pay with? 10, 20? What paper? What day was it? What was the headline? Did you fold it, put it under your arm? Did you step backwards or forwards, turn left or right? Okay, none of you have answers to this question. Did you even do what I asked? Yes, you did. You imagined buying a paper, but what you did is a hallmark of imagination, which is you imagined the central, essential feature, which is paper comes to me, and you left out all the details. Imagination has to leave stuff out, right? It can't take as long to imagine something as it does to do it. Otherwise, when somebody said, ah, oh, imagine living in Chicago, you'd be permanently sidelined. That would be the rest of your life. You know, I'm, I'm on day 47 now. Wait, I'm waking up for breakfast. That's not what, how imagination works. Imagination leaves stuff out, but what does it leave out? Well, it leaves out the inessential details. So if I say to you, imagine going to the dentist, this is the mental image you get, somebody monkeying around in your mouth. What you don't imagine, almost certainly, is parking the car or going through the new highlights for children in the, off in the waiting room, right? <laughs> Those are the parts that seem inessential. Now, thank you, imagination, for leaving out inessential details, except, and here's the problem, inessential details matter. All the thousands of little details that you don't imagine when you imagine actually end up affecting how happy or unhappy you are. Here, I'll give you an example. Um, this is the state of California, and if you do surveys and you ask Americans who don't live there, would you be happier if you lived in California? They give you a resounding yes. Oh, yeah, I'd be happier in California. If you ask Californians, are you happier than people who don't live in California? They go, oh, yeah, we're happier than people who don't live in California. They're all wrong. There is actually no reliable uh, correlation between living in California and happiness. Why do we all make this mistake? Because living in California brings up this picture for almost all of us, right? Beautiful people, beautiful beaches. Here's what you don't imagine. You don't imagine traffic. You don't imagine earthquakes. You don't imagine the fact that when you get there, you have to have a job where you've got a mother-in-law, you get the flu, you get divorced, you get a different mother-in-law. All the stuff of real, ordinary life happens in California. And be now, these things are important, and they will affect your happiness. But when somebody says, would you like living in California, you go, beach water, beach water, beach water. That's imagination leaving out important stuff. Now, 
It turns out that you can, I can demonstrate to you that this is a key problem in people forecasting their hedonic or emotional reactions to future events because you can improve people's accuracy of imagination simply by asking them to imagine a few of the details they left out. Here's a very simple study. Football fans are asked how they're going to feel three days after a very, very big, important game between two teams that are arch rivals. Now, one group is asked, we'll call this the narrow focus condition. They're simply asked the question that you see up there. How will you feel? How happy or unhappy on a scale from unhappy to happy? How will you feel three days after your team wins or after your team loses? Another group of people are asked exactly this question, but they're asked to do one thing first. Before you tell me how you're going to feel three days after this game is played, tell me first the things you'll be doing. And these are students, and so they say things like, well, I guess I've got an exam between now and then. Oh, there's a cool party I'm going to go to. Uh, oh, I've got to mow the lawn. Uh, I'm going to call my sister. The usual stuff people do in three days, all the things that imagination normally leaves out. Let's look at the data on how accurate these people are. In the narrow focus condition, we see a pattern of data we see every time we study these kinds of events, mainly that the losers overestimate how, happy, uh, how unhappy they're going to be and the winners overestimate how happy they're going to be. Hey, hello, it's a football game. It's three days later. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference. But when people are predicting, they think it'll matter. These are, any deviation from that line in the middle of the graph is, is inaccuracy. But look at the at the wide focus condition. Simply asking people the question, tell me some things you'll be doing in those three days, ameliorates this error, makes people more accurate in predicting how they're going to feel three days after a football game. So here's lesson number one. What we don't imagine matters more than we imagine it does. That's the essential point. Lesson number two. Answer number two. I guess it's not much of a lesson. Let me introduce you to answer number two by introducing you to some people that I met in the pages of the New York Times. Here are some things that they, that I, they have to say. Uh, I'm so much better off physically, financially, mentally in almost every way. Uh, I don't have one minute's regret. It was a glorious experience, and I believe it turned out for the best. Who are these people? What are they talking about? Well, the first person is Jim Wright, who in this audience actually there are going to be a few people who recognize him. Jim Wright was the Speaker of the House of Representatives, probably at the time the most powerful Democrat in the United States. A young guy named Newt Gingrich caught him doing a shady book deal, and he resigned in disgrace. They catch up with Jim Wright decades later and ask him about his life. And what he doesn't say is, I resigned in disgrace. What do you think? I've got a terrible life. No, he says, I'm so much better off physically, financially, mentally, and in almost every other way. What's unusual about this is what other ways are there? I'm animally, minerally, vegetably. I mean, he's got them all, right? He's better off in every possible way. Okay. Here's the second guy from the newspaper. His name is Maurice Bickham, and you've never heard of him. Maurice Bickham was a 78-year-old man who uttered these words upon being released from prison in Louisiana. He had spent most of his life there for having the audacity to fight back against the Ku Klux Klansmen who had tried to lynch him. And uh, after spending, I believe he was in prison for 45 years, he's released, and somebody says, gee... Maurice, how was it? And he says, I don't have one minute's regret. It was a glorious experience. Okay. Not, it was okay, met some nice guys, the food was all right, there was a gym. It was a glorious experience. That's a word we usually re, re, uh, reserve for like a religious experience. Okay. Third guy is a person you've never heard of, but you should have heard of, uh, Harry Langerman. It turned out for the best what's Harry talking about. Well, Harry, in the, I think, 1940s, had an idea. He wanted to open a restaurant, so he went to his brother, who's an investment banker, and he said, will you bankroll me? And he said, you idiot, you don't know anything about restaurants. Harry had to admit that was true, so he got in his car, and he drove from the East Coast to the West Coast studying restaurants by stopping and eating in them. Gets to the West Coast, he pulls into a little hamburger stand owned by these guys named the McDonald's Brothers. He tries the burgers, goes, this is an idea. Can I franchise this restaurant? They say, sure, we want $3,000 for the franchise. Harry goes back to New York, this is all in the article, asks his brother, and his brother's famous words quoted here, are you idiot, no one eats hamburgers. He won't give him the money. Well, about six months, Ray Kroc gets the money and becomes, for a time, the richest man in America. What happens to Harry? A middle-level manager for the Black Angus restaurant chain. What does he have to say? Screw my brother? No, no. People do eat hamburgers? No. It turned out for the best. Just one more. 
These are four guys. Most everyone recognizes three of them, and us with white in our beards recognize all four. These are the Beatles, the original Beatles, Paul, John, George, and whoa, where's Ringo? Well, that's their original drummer, Pete Best. And as you know, Pete Best ended up getting flung out of the Beatles, and they found Ringo on a tour and became the world's most famous uh, popular music group. What does Pete Best say about all this? Well, he says, I'm happier than I would have been with the Beatles. If you even play a musical instrument, contemplate what he is saying here, okay? I am happier than I would have been being a member of the all-time most important, and it's not like he gave up music and went into the restaurant business. He's a session drummer, okay? But he's happier than he would have been with the Beatles. Here's the question. Are these people crazy? Answer, no, they are not crazy at all. They are doing exactly what brains are beautifully designed to do, and I'm going to show you the trick. This is called a Necker cube, uh, named after the Swiss crystallographer in 1832 who uh, designed it. And most of you have seen this lovely optical illusion. It's a cube that is an ambiguous object, which is to say there are two ways to interpret this drawing. And if you stare at it, you will see that you're looking at a, uh, a box and you feel like you're looking in and all of a sudden it goes, bink, and it seems to just pop and it lays on its side. That's because it can actually be read by your brain either way. Here, I'll help you by passing bars through it. If you're not seeing the illusion, this usually helps. Bing, bang, woo, right, okay. So this is cheaper than drugs. And if you've got nothing to do on a Friday night, you can basically sit around and watch this thing pop back and forth. And what will happen is it will just flip flop, flip flop for the rest of eternity till you get tired and basically fall in the shrubbery. Now, if I reward you for seeing it one way rather than the other. Something as simple as, hey, every time it's on its side, you tell me, and you go, side, top, side, top. And every time you go side, I go, hmm, oh, hmm. I give you a little subtle reward. Guess what happens? In about two minutes, you can't flip the cube. You can no longer see it from the top position because I've been rewarding your brain for seeing it on the side position. This tells us something important. It's not just that the brain resolves ambiguity, the brain exploits ambiguity. The human brain is designed to go shopping among the many ways in which it can interpret an ambiguous figure and pick the one that feels best, all other things being equal. It turns out that it's hard to draw an ambiguous figure, but almost every event you experience in life has plenty of ambiguity. Is resigning from the house losing your job, or is it gaining new freedom? Flip, flop, flip, flop. Is going to prison losing your freedom or being forced into a spiritual journey? Flip, flop, flip, flop. Is losing the gig of being one of the Beatles uh, losing an opportunity to make history, or is it gaining family happiness? Flip, flop. Flip, flop. That's what our brains are good at. They are designed to find the best way to see things. Now, what's amazing about this, because I don't think I've told you anything you probably don't already suspect from spending a few decades among the human beings on the planet. What's so amazing about this is people don't know that they will do this with ambiguous events even moments before they do it. Watch this. Let me talk to you for a moment about the, I'll show you a study on, the experience of rejection, an experience nobody likes and virtually all of us have had. We've all been in the position of having others tell us we're not going to give you what you want. We don't like you. We don't accept you. You can't be part of the fun. Now, oftentimes, rejection is ambiguous. You ask somebody for a date, they say no. Why did that happen? Could be that I'm no good. Flip, flop. Could be she just is an anti-Semite. Flip, flop, flip. Could be that I'm not handsome. Flip, flop. Yeah, could be that uh, she is gay. Flip, flop, flip. Right? And it's not too hard to go, oh, you know, I, I, I found the gay anti-Semite at the Ideas Festival. What was I to do? That's ambiguous rejection. But there's also unambiguous rejection. For example, when everybody turns you down for a date or something else, right, as my mother would have said, you know, they can't all be crazy. There's something wrong with you. Indeed. Okay. So here's the question. Now, if you knew that your brain could exploit ambiguity, and you do know that, you would know that if you were to come into my laboratory and I set up a situation in which you were rejected by one person or by many people, which would make you feel worse? Yes, being rejected by many people would make you feel worse than being rejected by one. Oh, you're all so smart. How come people in experiments, not too dumb people, say like, oh, Harvard students, 
How come they don't know this about themselves? Very simple experiment. We bring subjects into our laboratory. We create a model business, and they want a job in our model business. It involves tasting ice cream and making up funny names for it. We tell them they have to do a job interview and that they're going to be judged by, we tell half of them, by a single judge, and the other half by a whole panel of judges. A whole panel of judges, as long as one of them likes you, you'll get the job, but if they unanimously agree you're too stupid to taste ice cream, why then you don't get the job. With me? Everybody's applying for a job, and they're getting judged by the one or by the many. We ask them to predict how they're going to feel if they don't get the job, and then guess what we do? We don't hire any of them, we reject every one, and we measure how they really feel. This is a very short version of a very long experiment. Here's what they predict. They predict just what you would have pre predicted if I'd asked for a show of hands. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is, uh, I'm showing you first the actual data. Th what, they're sh what you're seeing here, I'm going to rewind and start my whole talk over. What I'm showing you here are the actual data. Guess what? People feel much better when they are rejected by one than when they are rejected by many. But here's what they predicted. They predicted they would feel miserable no matter what. When you ask a college student, how will you feel if you don't get the job, they just go, bad, really bad, rejection sucks, it'll hurt. What they don't do is preview that beautiful trick their brain will play. The moment they're rejected, they'll go, I didn't get the job. Well, what does one person know? Right, exactly, flip, flop, flip, flop. The lesson in this study and in studies like it is this, we can't foresee what we'll see once we are seeing it. I didn't read that very well. We can't foresee what we will see once we're seeing it. In other words, we can't look ahead and see that we will rationalize, adapt, and exploit ambiguity and see the world differently later than we do now. I don't know of anybody who's ever done a systematic study of people who've been left standing at the altar. But I'm willing right now to put $1,000 of my money on the follow I'll make the following prediction. If you ask those people to respond, was it the best day of your life or the worst day of your life, more will say it was the best day of their life. If you ask anybody about to get married, if you get left standing at the altar today, will it be the best day of your life or the worst day of your life, you will flip that result very clearly. That, my friends, is what uh, lesson number two is about. Answer number three. Okay, this is, a, this is what we technically call in visual psychology a gray bar. Now, if you look at this bar, you'll see it's equally gray on both sides, but I'm going to put a different colored background behind it. Keep watching it. In Zingo, acute optical illusion, one end of the bar looks dark, and the other end of the bar looks light. Why? Well, duh, your eye is comparing the foreground to the background. And against the dark background, the foreground looks lighter. Against the light background, the foreground looks darker. This is called a contrast effect, a simultaneous visual contrast. It turns out that contrast, comparing one, things change when you compare them to other things, is true at every level of our experience. Here's one with which you're familiar. Uh, retailers have known about the contrast effect uh, much longer than psychologists have, and they have used it for, well, probably millennia to bear you the, uh, spare you the undue burden of a heavy wallet. I want you to imagine that you are coming to my house for dinner. Uh, your mother raised you right. You're bringing me wine. You go to your local wine shop, and these are the wines on sale. They range from, I think it says $8 to $51. Which one will you buy? Well, studies are very clear. We know which one you're going to buy. First of all, you're not going to buy the $8 bottle of wine because you don't want to look cheap. Second, you're not going to buy the $51 bottle of wine because you are cheap. What you're going to do is buy the $27 bottle of wine. That's why your retailer keeps on hand something he calls an aspirational item. Right, it's a bottle of wine that no one in your neighborhood can afford. It sits there, it gathers dust, it's supposed to, it's never meant to be sold. Its only function is to make sure that when people who are on their way to my house come in, they buy the $33 bottle rather than the 27 this is simply the contrast effect. It's very clear that 33 looks cheaper in the context of 147 than it looked in the context of 51. Okay. Contrast effects also are a very important part of our predictions about happiness. So these are real data. If you ask people, which of these two jobs, getting out of college, which of these two jobs will make you happier? The one where you earn 100K and everybody else earns 110? Or the one where you earn 90K and everyone else earns 80? And what college students tell you is, I would be happier with the one where I actually make significantly less money, but I make more money than other people. Is that true? I mean, they're banking on the, con they're paying $10,000 for a contrast effect. 
Will they get it? Well, some studies suggest not. And this is where we're closing in on lesson number three. Here's the simplest experiment any Harvard student ever got paid five bucks to come to my lab and do. You come to the lab, you sit down, and there's a, a tray with some potato chips on it. And you are asked exactly two questions. First, predict for me how much you're going to enjoy eating these potato chips. Second, they eat them. How much did you enjoy eating these potato chips? Third, thank you, here's your money, go home, goodbye. That is the whole experiment. Now, there's one thing we don't tell them, which is that we conduct this experiment in one of two rooms. In one room, there are some items sitting at the edge of the table that happen to all be chocolate. And if you can't remember back that far, college students like potato chips, but they consider chocolate to be the single best thing you can put in your mouth without asking permission. They love chocolate, okay? <laughs> So these people are making these predictions about potato chips and eating them while there is a better food at the far end of the table. In another room, what we call the spam room, <laughs> there, are, there are items at the end of the table that college students say that they hate. These are things like spam, sardines, uh, canned salmon. There's even, if you looked closely at the slide, you would see there is such a thing as canned haggis. You can get sheep intestine in a can, and by God, we've got a can of it in the lab. Okay, so here's the question. How do these rooms that they're in affect the predictions they make and the experiences they have? Well, look how they affect the predictions dramatically. If you are asked to predict how much you like, you're going to like potato chips while you're in a spam room, you say, oh, God, I'm going to love them. And if you're asked the same question in a chocolate room, you go, oh, you know, they'll be good, but you know, not, not so much. Is that true? No. Because once you put cr crackly, greasy, fried, salty potato in your mouth, it doesn't matter what you're not eating, right? Once you are chewing potato chips, you like them or you don't, but you're not going, oh man, this is so not spam. Mmm, God, man, this is really not chocolate. No, you're going potato, 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 potato. You're enjoying the experience as much as you will, and you are not making the comparison that you yourself, 30 seconds before, said you were going to make. It turns out that this is true in area after area of life. We think we are constantly going to be saying, if I marry her, I'll spend my whole life going, why didn't I marry her? If I buy this house, I'll always be thinking about the house I didn't buy. And the truth is, people rarely think about the things they didn't do or didn't happen to them. Now, I know you're going, well, maybe some people don't, but I know I do, and I'm going to guess that you're wrong. You're suffering from the refrigerator light illusion. You remember when you were a kid, you thought the refrigerator light was always on because every time you check, it's on? The truth you now know is it's always off except when you check. It turns out that whenever you ask yourself the question, am I thinking about something other than what I'm doing right now? The answer is yes, yes. Just now, you are now starting to think about something you're not doing. The problem is nobody's ever keeping track of all the times you're not keeping track. When psychologists keep track of how often you have thoughts like, I could have had a V8, it turns out it's almost never. A few of you at some point in this talk have already said, I could have been watching the parade. But you probably thought it once for a moment and then came right back to me. Many of you have never left. Very few of you have spent the whole time going, I don't know, he's not Madeleine Albright, he's just not Madeleine Albright, he's just not Madeleine Albright. Okay. The point is that we are in the here and now a lot more than we realize. In the future, we're going to be living in the present. We will not be looking back so much on our past. Okay, so the last answer has nothing to do with imagination. Because I have talked as though we are this guy staring into a crystal ball. It is our duty to somehow close our eyes and use this new part of our brain to figure out what we will like, how happy we'll be. But that ignores the fact that every one of us lives in a society. We are surrounded by grandmothers and rabbis and uncles and dear abbies and taxi drivers and bartenders, all sorts of people who are very happy to do the imagining for us and tell us exactly where happiness is to be found. We are the inheritors of huge amounts of cultural wisdom about happiness. Even if you didn't have a frontal lobe, you'd know the things that are supposed to make you happy because your mother would have told you. Are the things that our culture whispers in our ear about the sources of happiness right or are they wrong? Well, it turns out over the last decade or two, psychologists, economists, and neuroscientists have been trying to find out the validity of our cultural wisdom. I thought I would just give you a few highlights uh, of what those studies show. This is my mom. 
And my mom, probably like a lot of your moms, told you that there were at least three important things if you wanted to be happy. They were marriage, money, and children. Now, she didn't give me the bullet list. She said something more like, you really should find a nice girl and settle down. It wouldn't hurt if she was Jewish. You really should find a good job you like. It wouldn't hurt if you were comfortable. And you should really have children. It wouldn't hurt if it was soon. Okay, I don't know. You probably had a mother who said basically these things to you. Was my mom right about any of this, all of this, some of this? The answer, it turns out, is yes. Let me start at the beginning with marriage. So how many people here think that marriage has been established to be a cause of happiness? Okay, I see a man who's raising, his wife is raising his hand. <laughs> okay, either most of you are scared or most of you are just wrong because it turns out marriage is an extremely good predictor of happiness. Married people are much happier than unmarried people. And by unmarried, I don't just mean not yet married, but uh, you know, divorced, widowed, single, living together. All of those uh, uh, groups are not as happy as married people. And why should they be? Because on anything you could measure that you would think would be related to happiness, married people win. They make more money per capita. They are healthier. They eat better. They have sex more often. They enjoy it more. Yes, they enjoy it more. <laughs> now, I see head shaking. Bye. <laughs> you should not do that. Not in public. Um, it turns out one economist recently computed, did shadow pricing and computed how much more money you would have to earn every year to equal the happiness you get from being married. And the answer is $100,000 for the average person who makes less than $100,000. This is a big, big benefit. I should say, by the way, that marriage turns out to be a much better pre uh, uh, predictor of happiness for men than for women. Everybody gets something out of marriage. Men really get something out of marriage, which you know, conflicts with the idea that they get dragged to the altar kicking and screaming, and then they get almost all the good. Um, now, what you might say is, yeah, but these, these kinds of data, we can't tell if, happiness, if marriage makes you happy or happiness makes you married, right? It might be the happy people do better on the marriage market. Guess what? They do. But both of these things are true. We know, like looking at longitudinal data, if you follow the same people over time and you look at their happiness before and after wedding, what do you see? As they're getting close to the wedding, they're going, oh, wedding, 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 happy, happy, happy. They're getting happier and happier. They get married. They have a honeymoon. And then their happiness starts to retreat. But what it doesn't do is go back to where they were before they even planned to get married. So marriage, it seems, my mom was right about, does seem to be a cause of happiness. What about money? My mother wasn't particularly materialistic, but she just didn't think it would hurt to be comfortable. Was she right? Well, there's a lot of data on happiness and wealth, and there are two facts that seem very, very robust that seem to come out no matter how you measure it, and they are these. The first is the fact that economists refer to as diminishing marginal utility, which for the rest of us simply means a little money matters a lot and a lot of money matters a little. The first dollar you earn is going to make a big, big difference. The next dollar, just a little less. And by the time you are earning your millionth dollar, it's just not mattering much. Now, note, the curve never goes down. It doesn't look like, oops, I hit the point where I've got too damn much money. But what does happen is very soon, earning more dollars isn't giving you much of a boost. What is this inflection point? There's arguments about it. Some people think it's as high as 100000 a year. Some as low as $40,000 a year. It's nowhere near what you might have imagined being millions of dollars per year. So now an economist who, who I, I once showed this graph to an economist, he said, you know, it always occurred to me that if money doesn't make you happy, you're just not spending it right. That actually may be true. It might not be an inviolable law of nature that the curve has to go like that. It might just be that people who are accumulating huge amounts of wealth are not doing with it what they could do with it to make themselves happier. So a nice example, almost everybody who starts to make a lot of money moves out of a city and buys a big house. Error, error. People adapt very quickly to the square footage of their house. A bigger house makes you happy for about a minute. Commuting makes you unhappy every day because it's a new, different kind of hell. Commuting is a very negative, negative correlative happiness. Do not trade a mile for another square foot. It's almost always a bad deal. But when people get up on that curve, that's exactly what they do. What else do they do? Well, they keep their money. And studies show that, in fact, 
people can get a lot more happiness from spending it on others than spending it on themselves. Simple. This just came out in science this year. A beautiful little study. You bring students into the laboratory, you hand them 20 bucks and you go, go outside, go out and spend this, come back in an hour. Half of them, you say, buy yourself something nice. The others, you have to give it away. You measure how happy they are when they come back. It's a wildly big effect. The people who gave it away are just beaming. I gave $20 to this guy. It was really great. He looked at me and he smiled so fantastic. The other people went, yeah, I got a, I got a new pen. It's cool. I, right? So we may be doing the wrong things with money. Now, I told you there were two facts about money to know. The first is that a, a little buys you a lot and a lot buys you a little. The second fact about money that we know is nicely illustrated by these data. Here's real income in the United States over 30 years. You all know this. Americans have gotten richer and richer in real dollars. Here's happiness over 30 years. Nada. Nothing has changed. Now, if money buys you some happiness, shouldn't that line at least be going up? Well, it turns out it's not absolute dollars that makes people happy. It's relative dollars. It's not how one economist put it nicely the best predictor of a man's happiness is not his salary it's his salary divided by his brother-in-law's salary yes <laughs> it's not how much money you are making it's how much more money you are making than other people relative dollars are the better predictor of happiness what this suggests is that we are all on a treadmill that is every time all of us get a dollar it makes no difference because we're in the same position I'm running after the guy who makes just a little bit more than me wishing for what he had and every time I get a hundred thousand dollars extra then so does he and damn it I'm in the same darn place so the suggestion I guess from these data is that probably you should start hanging out with poorer people <laughs> Okay, so last, children. Well, this is an easy one, right? What do we call children? We refer to them as a bundle of joy. And if you look at the data, the data are very, very clear. People with children are much less happy than people with them. <laughs> now, this is an accumulation. I want you to know this is not a study I did in my lab. We're talking about uh, Great Britain panel survey. We're talking about almost all of the data economists and sociologists have plowed through in America, Canada, Western Europe over the last 25 years. In study after study, you see that either children have no effect or they have a small negative effect. I do not know of a single study showing that people with children are happier than people without them. Now, one possibility you might say is, but maybe happy people just don't have kids, right? People who are really just so delighted with life and themselves, they go off and they play. And so it might be that people are sorting themselves into these categories based on their happiness. Well, first of all, wouldn't it be a little odd that they choose to be parents, but they're more miserable when their children are little than when they're big? Those are both groups of people. But anyway, here's the way you test that hypothesis. You look at longitudinal data. Here are longitudinal data. These are, that is, these are the same people followed over time before and after the birth of their child. Now, just to give my mom a moment, here's what she predicts. My mom says, you go along in life, it's fine, and then you have a child like you, and everything's better, and it stays better. Was my mom right? Well, my mom sure was right about some of it until she was wrong. Those are what longitudinal data on happiness look like. People are pretty happy, and they really look forward to the baby, and then the baby comes, and happiness plummets. I'll give you just one more piece of data because I know these are hard data to believe. This is a study published about two years ago in Science, the really the very best scientific journal in the world, uh, published by a Nobel laureate. And uh, in this study, about 1,000 women are followed around electronically as they go about their day, and the researchers collect two pieces of data. One, how happy are they at different moments in their day? And two, what are they doing? And this allows the researchers to say, how happy are women when they're doing this and how happy are they when they're doing that? And here's some of the things that women are doing when they report being very happy when they happen to be talking to their friends or they happen to be eating. Okay, sources of pleasure. Here's they're less happy when they're grocery shopping and really not very happy when they're doing housework. So this is the question. How happy are they when they're with their children? Well, it turns out that they're pretty um, about somewhere near vacuuming. That's right. That's right. They are less happy when they're with their kids in any shape, way, or form than when they're shopping for groceries. Okay. Now, we laugh. I, I see you're amused by this, but I know in your heart of hearts you don't believe it because most of you are parents and you are thinking to yourself, my children are my greatest source of joy. And so before I totally explode your myth, I just want to go on record as saying, I am related to this other bald-looking guy here. That is my son. He is one of my greatest sources of joy. And I only say one of because now I've got two grandchildren who are even greater sources of joy because they're twice as cute and much less work for me. 
I don't hate kids. I love kids. I, I have a kid. But what we know is that science asks us to believe things that conflict with our intuition, right? I don't see a black hole. I cannot see gravity. What are you talking about germs? Show me germs. Science tells us that sometimes our eyes fool us and our intuitions are wrong. When science gives you data that says your intuitions are wrong, you don't say, well, let's find some data that support my intuitions. You say, why aren't, well, if you worked in the Bush administration, that is what you do. But otherwise you say, otherwise you say, how can I make sense of the fact that the data tell me a truth about the world that doesn't seem to be the way it feels? I think it is incumbent on us not just to say, children don't seem to be a source of happiness, but to explain why every one of us thinks that's just absurd. I have three hypotheses about why we all believe something that data suggests are wrong. This is the view these data I've given you are the view of happiness from outer space. Here's my three answers. I think that the reason we all believe that children are a great source of happiness when the data say otherwise uh, are Armani socks, heroin, and baseball. Let me explain. Armani socks. Now, I don't know if anyone here, this is actually a crowd where we might have somebody wearing Armani socks, so forgive me if you're that person, but if you were to go buy a pair of Armani socks, almost surely sometime in the next two weeks you will be telling somebody how great they are. Go, oh my God, you, I know they're 250 bucks a pair, but you've never walked on a cloud like you walk on with these things. I feel like dancing. I feel like skipping. You will be telling others how great they are. Now, it could be because Armani socks are great, but it could be because you just paid a lot of money for them. That's right. Basic law of economics, we pay a lot of money when things are valuable. Basic law of psychology, we value things a lot when we pay a lot of money for them. The more we pay for them, the more we value them. The more people suffer for anything, the more valuable it is, the more they love it. Gee, what does that sound like? Yes, it sounds like raising children. We give them our hearts. We give them our blood, our sweat, and our tears. What kinds of morons would we be if they weren't making us happy? Of course they must make me happy. Why would I be doing this, giving up all that other stuff if they weren't? One reason I think we believe that our children are a great source of happiness and joy is that we'd be very foolish to have had them, we think, if they aren't. Second, heroin. Now, everybody knows that heroin is a great source of human misery. Wrong, it isn't. Heroin is actually a great source of joy. Anybody ever had a narcotic? Surely you've, probably not illegally, but you've been in the hospital, right? The lumbar went out and they gave you the morphine and you went, never let it stop, God. Yes, that's because heroin is actually a huge source of pleasure and joy. The reason it creates human misery isn't because heroin makes you feel bad, it's because it makes you feel so good that you give up every other source of pleasure. You stop washing, bathing, brushing your teeth, you don't go to work, you give up your family, you just basically walk around trying to get more heroin. The problem with heroin isn't it makes you feel sad, it's that it makes you feel so good that it crowds out every other source of joy and thereby lowers your average happiness. What does that sound like? Yes, it sounds like children. It's not that children are, when you see your child, you think, I'm not having a good time. It's that children require so much, particularly at certain points in their life cycle, that they crowd out all the other pleasures. Yes, I've got a baby. I no longer have sex with my spouse. I don't see a play. I don't go to a restaurant. I can barely find time to, and you name it. So when people say, Professor Gilbert, you don't know what you're talking about. My child's my greatest source of joy. I say, yes, when you have one, it's your greatest. That's right. And that's what parenthood is. Okay. It's not, you know, I guess what I'm saying is that even if the company of a child was nothing but a joy, they require so much company. That's really the point. Okay. Third, uh, oh, no, I, I want to make one more point about heroin. Uh, so I say that um, I, I've said that they crowd out other sources of joy. I already showed you marriage is a huge source of happiness in people's lives. This is marital satisfaction over the lifespan. You're looking at thousands of data points. This is a very typical finding. People start out getting married and they're happy because that's why they got married in the first place and then it basically just goes to hell. And marital happiness goes down, 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 down as they have children, as the children are growing up and then it starts to recover. Why? Well, if you could get close enough to that slide, you'd see the children are leaving home. My father is a biologist, and he, uh, you know, he's always asked as a biologist, whenever he discusses the issue of human abortion, he's asked, Professor Gilbert, where does, when does life really begin? And he says, you know, when the dog dies and the kids leave home. That's his standard joke. But actually, I don't know about the dog dying, but it turns out to be true of 
of the children leaving. People report some of the greatest happiness in their life when they're empty. You know, the only known symptom of S empty nest syndrome was made up by journalists, right? It's not a DSM category. The only known symptom is smiling. People are going, yeah, yeah, the kids are out. Yeah, it's really rough. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is, I, I should say, though, there's a little bit of controversy about this line. Some data don't show as much recovery as this. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, yes, so they crowd out. Okay, the last point I wanted to make was about baseball. Uh, so I grew up in Chicago. I'm a big Cubs fan. I uh, live in Boston. I love the Red Sox. And if I were to go watch the Red Sox play the Yankees, and it was a no-hitter, and then in the bottom of the ninth, Euclid comes to bat and hits a home run, and we win the game against those bastards. If you asked me, how was that game, I would say it was amazing. That actually isn't right. A no-hitter is like watching grass grow. It's the most boring thing you can do in a baseball park. You will be eating hot dogs and reading the schedule backwards. The reason I will think this was an amazing game is because it had an amazing moment. And it turns out when you do research on human memory, people remember episodes by peak moments. Uh, what I'm remembering is that fantastic 30 seconds of the game, and I'm forgetting the three hours of hell. What does that sound like? Yes, it's, that's a day with a five-year-old, isn't it? No, not yet, not now. We'll be there soon. I already told you, don't hit your brother. And then, just when you think, you know, there's no hits, just when the, the four-year-old looks up and goes, I love you, Daddy. <laughs> home run, home run of the heart. A transcendent moment that when you look back on it and you're tucking them in and go, wasn't it a great day? No, actually, if a psychologist had been following you, they'd say, you had 30 really good seconds. The rest was not so good. You can't really call that a good day, but memory is a wonderful thing. So in a sense, children may not make us happy often, but when they make us happy, they may give us a transcendent kind of happiness that almost acts as an amnestic, right? It almost wipes out our memory for all the moments of drudgery. That's the view of happiness from outer space. That's what we know from looking at data on human beings. Now, if my mom were here, first of all, she would have left long ago. But if I gave her a chance, I said, Mom, ask some questions, she would have said a few things. First, she would have said, okay, Mr. Smarty Pants, if having them is bad, let me tell you this, not having them is worse. My mom might be right. The data don't rule out this possibility. Here are data I showed you from, re I showed you this curve. These are real people building up to having a baby, and then they have it, and their happiness goes down. But it might be, and we don't have these kinds of data. Here are hypothetical people who wanted kids but didn't get them. It might be that they're less happy. Yes, it might be children or hard work, but we all want them. By and large, almost everybody does. And they take a little of the joy out of life, but not getting them would be worse. Nothing I've said is a prescription that says, I guess I shouldn't have kids, because we don't know what that yellow line really looks like. My mother also would have reminded us that if children don't make you happy, it might be your fault, not theirs, right? It's easy to hear these data and go, wow, little shitheads, I wonder why did I, right? Maybe they are great potential sources of joy, and as parents, we somehow screw it up. We somehow don't get all the joy out of them that we might. Remember what the economists said about dollars. If they're not making you happy, you're spending it wrong. Well, maybe if your children aren't making you happy, you're parenting them wrong. Maybe you're doing things like, you're way up on that dollar curve and you're chasing a few more and spent, instead of spending time with kids in, the, in a way that actually could bring you satisfaction. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like I'm preaching here. We don't know if that's true. But my mom could be right that it's potentially true. Finally, my mother would say, you know, life is about more than happiness. Now, we could have a long discussion about this. I actually think she's wrong. I don't think it's about more than happiness. I think that's exactly what it's about. But here's the point. Science can't tell us whether life should be or shouldn't be about happiness. That's not a factual question, that's a moral question. Maybe the fact that children don't make us happy and that we have them anyway says something wonderful about it. Maybe that's actually our most noble trait, that we're willing to sacrifice a little of our happiness to do something that we think brings meaning and is important. The fourth lesson, your mother doesn't know everything. That's part of why you mispredict the future. So I've talked to you about four answers. I've given you four reasons why human beings don't always do a splendid job of knowing where their happiness lies, of making the pursuit of happiness one that they can actually achieve. It's because we, what we don't imagine matters more than we imagine it does, because we can't foresee what we will see once we're seeing it, 
because in the future we'll live in the present and because your mother doesn't know everything. Now, when somebody stands up here for 45 minutes or an hour, I've lost count, I'm sorry, and basically shows you all the ways in which people make mistakes, it has to occur to you, yeah, okay, fine. If we're all so stupid, how do we get to the moon? Well, I do study mistakes. I study the mistakes people make, and it's a fair enough question. Are people really hopelessly uh, naive? Are people really stupid? Of course we're not stupid. It's just that we're designed to pursue happiness. We're not designed to find it. Nature doesn't give a damn if you're happy. Nature cares if you survive and reproduce. It, it, that means that if you want happiness, you suddenly have to, you somehow have to outmaneuver the survival and reproduction machine that is the three pound meatloaf between your ears. You have to come to understand what it is for, what it does well, and what it does badly. You have to become skeptical of the things that it tells you. I always loved this line, the comedian Emo Phillips. He said, You know, I always thought the brain was the most amazing organ in the human body. And then I thought, Wait, who's telling me that? Yes, exactly. I really do think, though, that by understanding, understanding how, what happiness is, but also understanding how we predict and mispredict it, we do give ourselves the best chance of not stumbling, upon, uh, not stumbling on happiness, but stumbling upon it. I think my time should be up. I'm certainly out of ideas, and this is an idea fest, so I'll stop there. Thank you.